would characterize Washington's mood about the Arab Spring? The initial uh, mood has, has splintered into man, many different interpretations and moods. Uh, the main events that related to the U.S. was the intervention in Libya. There was U.S. backing for that, and then non-intervention in Syria. The non-action in Syria has now certainly led to the biggest uh, problem in the Middle East for, for many years, and uh, has also included a resurgence of al-Qaeda, mm. something uh, about which the U.S. is very concerned, but still doesn't have a policy how to, how to deal with. I think the main thing going for the U.S. Uh, that the Obama administration is focusing on in the Middle East, after the failure of the Geneva two-track and the failure of the Israeli-Palestinian talks, the U.S.-Iranian talks are still going on. It seems to me that there was a sense in the administration in early 2011 that we were at a strategic moment in the Middle East and the U.S. could play a role. I think there's much more of a sense now that A, it might not be such a strategic moment and B, the U.S. might not have the same ability to play a role. One of the, the things that, that somebody in the White House once told me is we used to spend a lot of time fighting over the steering wheel on Egypt policy. And, and people would fight, just turn a little bit this way, turn a little bit that way. And then people looked up and said, you know what, the steering wheel's not connected to anything. We can have all these fights about exactly what the policy should be, but it doesn't have a direct connection to what happens on the ground. And I think that's one of the things that's led the administration to say, let's concentrate really on what is strategic. And what is strategic is not the grinding along of small crises but what's strategic is something that could really change the, the landscape, something like an Arab-Israeli deal. One of the things I think is interesting is in many ways the administration's Middle East strategy is all tied up in negotiations. Mm. So you have Arab-Israeli negotiations, you have Iran negotiations, you have Syria negotiations, but this is an administration that's not shown a lot of love for negotiations, a lot of skill in negotiations. What's the, weather, what's the weatherman's folk, uh, forecast then for the, for the region? So on the Syrian front, the Assad regime, perhaps like any other political power, is not going to give a major concession unless it's under major threat. When President Obama threatened to bomb Damascus within hours effectively, uh, the Assad regime and Iran and Moscow agreed to convince the Assad regime to give up the one strategic weapon it had built over the last 40 years, which was chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. So it's the use of power that can then be, you know, resolved through a, through a diplomatic so, deal. So diplomacy as the culmination of a balance or an imbalance of power is no longer the case because the Obama administration is not putting pressure well, sometimes it on does, the Syrian regime. Sometimes it doesn't. On Today, the chemical weapons deal, yeah. I mean, they say war is the continuation of politics by other means. Diplomacy is the continuation of war by other means as well. It's all one currency. It's power, pressure, and So where, where are we now on the question of Obama versus Assad? Uh, right now, Assad is in a comfortable position. Uh, the Obama administration is not applying any significant pressure on the regime. Uh, there is talk of slight increase of support for the opposition, but certainly nothing that will be a game changer in Syria. And you know, John, as soon as I heard that, that Obama agreed to pursue Assad in the ICC, I thought this is it. I mean, there's, no, not, there's not, nothing is going on because it's going to just drag, and that means there's no policy. The policy is, to my mind, defined more in terms of what it isn't than what it is. Right? So the policy is no boots on the ground, no active intervention, no steps that will create an open-ended commitment because the President's belief is that, that the strategic imperative is to get the U.S. out of wars, not to get the U.S. into more open-ended wars. So no more red lines either, right? Well, I mean, the, the red line issue is an issue of talking. And I think this administration thinks a lot about what it says, and sometimes it is coordinated, and sometimes it's uncoordinated. It wasn't but, about talking. It was, be, it was supposed to bomb if a red line was crossed. But then, well, he didn't say I'm going to bomb yes, if the red I mean, line is crossed. That's, that's the conclusion that people drew. The president of the most important power today says Assad needs to go. Three years ago, and Assad is still there, and and the chief. Uh, uh, of, of the world's superpower is totally indifferent, basically. I mean, not doing anything about it. I mean, there's a problem there, no? I mean, aren't you sending a message when you say the asset needs to go and you are the President of the United States? 
I, in his view, saying Assad must go is setting a goal for collective action, but doesn't bear with it any necessary action. That it seems to me if you say Assad must go, getting the words is not a policy. It, it begs the question of, so what is actually the strategy? What are the actions? And I think there have been a lot of small actions. And we've seen tremendous U.S. humanitarian support. We've seen non-lethal support. We've seen reports of some training in Jordan. Uh, it's unclear exactly what the policy is. Some of it presumably is covert. But what we haven't seen is any evidence of a genuine affirmative strategy. We've seen what the strategy isn't. We've seen the silhouette of the strategy. And Obama uh, said clearly in a statement that he is, he, w that uh, sometime in 2013, that the U.S. wants Assad to go in a form of transition, but wants to maintain the institutions of the Syrian state. That's a very different position. That part was not articulated earlier. Mm -hmm. It's also clear that U.S. allies to the south of Syria, Israel, and Jordan are very concerned that the, the Syrian state will simply collapse and they will have al-Qaeda groups on their border mm -hmm. and so on. So U.S. policy today certainly is work towards a transition and Assad's departure through some managed situation, support the non-al-Qaeda opposition for them to maintain their ground and not to lose ground, and if possible to put pressure on the Assad regime and to put pressure and push back at the Al-Qaeda Do you think there's going to be more of that? But it's a theoretically, only theoretically calibrated, but that's kind of the context. The U.S. certainly is not interested in or committed to any use of direct or indirect force which would quickly topple the Assad regime. So what you're saying, 150,000 dead, estimated, the country is going to continue to bleed. But that's what I sadly believe, and I've written many times, that this is, this is not a resolution. This is going to go on for many years, maybe a decade, maybe, maybe more than a decade. And the entire country is being decimated. And other countries are being destabilized. Yes. And silence in Washington? No, there's not silence. I think there's, there's a lot. Words. There are words. No, I think you, you see even within the Obama administration, there are many, including the Secretary of State, who seem to be leaning toward a more active policy, but the... But the White House isn't. Well, and the President in particular uh, yeah. seems to feel there's a strategic imperative not to have a large open-ended engagement, which will only draw the U.S. in further without resolving the problem. Now, whether that's an accurate assessment or not, I, I have my own views, but, but the President's assessment seems to be that the strategic imperative is not to do things that will lead us down a slippery slope of intervention, which in fact will not resolve the problem. The policy is trying to keep Jordan and Turkey and, and Lebanon stable, to some degree Iraq, I assume, trying to provide for the most urgent humanitarian needs of refugees. As you know, tens of millions of people have been displaced by this conflict. It is palliative. Look, I, I mean, I know we're, I know you're a strategist, you think that we research, but I don't mean to be dramatic, but how many Syrians need to die in order for the situation to be right? That's not the question. The question is, what might the U.S. do at what cost over what period of time that would be guaranteed to fix the problem? The fundamental problem is how do you achieve political outcomes from using military means. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very hard to do. There was a military intervention in Libya just recently. So is, you're saying that military intervention does not help. Is, no, that, no, no. is that the lesson to draw from Look, first, the military intervention First, in first the, mili the, the, the military always is resistant to intervening, mm -hmm. right? I mean, militaries hate using militaries. And I think part of it, and I've been in some meetings in the White House when I'm trying to read the faces of the guys with lots of stars on their shoulders, they don't want to be saddled with political outcomes. And I think what you're seeing in this administration, after more than a decade of war in Afghanistan, after almost a decade of war in Iraq, is can you, can you give me any assurance that after all this effort, after all these lives on both sides that are going to have to be shed, 
that we actually are going to be in a better place. Libya is going to turn to a failed state, be that as it may. The pretext for that was that there could have been a genocide. Well, there's an ongoing genocide in Syria for the last two and a half some years. And the but U.S. role was we would participate but not lead. And there's a huge amount of criticism in the administration for willing to participate and not lead. I think what was important about Libya is you did have a huge European push. Mm -hmm. And this was then supporting NATO allies in a military operation rather than a unilateral effort to try to change the situation on the ground. I want to mention two things about the Obama administration and the situation in Syria. I think there are two principles or you know major issues that have that have been mishandled and are at stake. One is one relates to international order. Now he did react on the issue of international order when it comes to use of weapons of mass destruction. He did react on another international principle which is responsibility to protect. Uh, which has, you know, That's become, yes, he did react in Libya and his, uh, his administration is still very proud that they acted there. Of course, every situation is different. The principle of international order, which Obama claims to be very, you know, giving much importance to on the weapons of mass destruction, he also acted on it in responsibility to protect. And one, both moral and international order failure that Obama is committing in Syria is making no statement about responsibility to protect, any red or orange line about how many people a government can kill freely with advanced weapons without anybody really doing anything about it. That is not a specific Syrian issue. That has become an issue of international order, and I think Obama has failed, and that will be part of his legacy, that he did not speak out. I don't think it uniquely falls on the U.S. I think there, there's a lot of um, desire to use no-fly zones because they seem like a very limited form of war. The reality is the way you set up a no-fly zone is you destroy the air defenses in which many people will be killed, especially if air defenses are integrated to civilian areas. But many less people than have and will be killed. I mean, yes. But innocent it's people an will be war. killed yeah. and then you have, and then it is an act of war to maintain a no-fly zone. But well, then Washington needs to give up its, uh, its, uh, its title of the it's guardian of international order. It's not a, I mean, the indispensable nation was the, the slogan of a previous U.S. administration. Right. And the more the United States does, the more demands there are for the U.S. to do more things, the more other countries pull back. I don't know, but on the issue of Syria, the U.S. has neither acted directly nor marshaled its allies effectively through a thought through careful plan. If you don't want to do a no-fly zone, then you have to support and arm the opposition. If it's not arming the opposition, you have to do something else. The U.S. has not acted directly, has not effectively brought together and coordinated what the Allies could do. The period. complaint has been, on the U.S. government side, that we have tried to work with these guys to get them together, and they seem to be more oriented toward fighting each other than fighting the Assad government. It is a problem. And uh, that one of the consistent problems with U.S. Them to, one, of the one, of the consistent, one of the consistent problems in U.S. support for the opposition has been getting the opposition to work together. And one of the things that people and the government told me consistently true, was true. if you thought that the Libyan opposition was, was rent apart by factional fighting, you haven't seen anything yet because the Syrian opposition is utterly incompetent or utterly, utterly incapable of working a common purpose. So that's an explanation or that's a pretext for, but it's not, also for not partly, doing something. It's true. It's obviously true. But the Libyan opposition is an equal example. It's not an opposition. It's a bunch of groups of people who overthrew with NATO help. A, a, a terrible regime. That is true, that this opposition was extremely frustrating, remains very divided, very ineffective. But it's also true that there's much that could have been done in terms of providing centralized command and control, overseeing it, uh, providing financial and military support that would then create a center which others might. It's, it's a gamble, it's not sure, but to say that well, look, they're divided, so we're gonna, just gonna basically not going to be able to do anything. That would be nice if it didn't have a cost. The cost is the biggest humanitarian disaster basically since maybe World War II. A, destabil a destruction of Syria, you know, displacement of millions of people. 
huge de destabilization of, of, of Iraq. Iraq might not survive as United uh, one country. And of Lebanon, Lebanon and Jordan. Jordan. So yes, if it were, you know, well, they're not really united. It's difficult. We're not really interested in getting involved. That's fine if you don't open the other page, which says, okay, well, here's the take consequences. the cost. Consequences for the region and for the U.S.